Meditators, welcome to another episode of the Market Meditations podcast. Today I have with me a good friend and uh, founder and CEO of Daffy Protocol, Zane. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. We were talking about a lot of good stuff which should have probably been recorded in the the introductory part like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so already we're already in the zone, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll get into that stuff. We'll get into that stuff. I'm sure people will uh, enjoy the episode, our natural banter, and we'll do our very, very best to keep fitness, not to a minimum, but to a contained portion of the episode. It's a side topic. It may or may not be discussed. You've got a way to find out pretty much <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's going to be a side secondary topic to crypto which i think is why a lot of people listen to this uh podcast so uh how did you get into crypto zane what's your story is it the um usual 2017 everyone was making money i wanted to make money too <laughs> i won't lie that was definitely one part of it <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna sit here and talk about you know what in 2017 i stumbled upon this technology everyone was here because of trading right um but in all honesty, I actually got into crypto because um, I was trading in other markets um, and the volatility in Bitcoin was always being discussed whenever you're looking at indices, foreign exchange, stuff like that. So, um, I mean, you can't not look into it. Um, and I think if you're just very, very curious at that time in 2016, 2017, everyone was kind of like looking for new ideas. Um, but yeah, 2017, it's just it was kind of the craze, right? Everyone. I think if anyone's been around from 2017, you've got 2017 mania in your head. You've got 2018 PTSD. You know, we've been through it all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've lived the tale pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so you actually started out as a trader. What took you away from it? Um, I won't say the stress um, and the aging before. <laughs> I won't say that. <laughs> um, um, but I think actually it was kind of going back to the cliche. I did actually fall in love a lot. I had a lot of love for the technology that... Um, you know, just it made a lot of sense to me in different applications in different areas. Um, and I really wanted to actually get my name out there in the space a little. So I started to speak at a lot of uh, universities in England, um, a lot of institutions here, and then eventually a lot of um, blockchain conferences and stuff. So um, around 2017, 2018, I was doing a lot of that, uh, which was cool. Um, again, just like furthering, you know, the industry, trying to get non-crypto people into crypto, both on the traditional side is pretty cool. Um, so that's why I kind of focus more on, I'm not saying I don't do trading now, but just definitely not as much <laughs> as I used to. Oh, what made you decide to go talk at conferences and stuff as a first step? Like what, what was the game plan there? Um, honestly, I think it was more personal development really. I think, um, and I was saying this to you as well earlier that I wasn't initially by na by nature, like someone who was great at public speaking and good at getting, uh, conversations and concepts across it as easily um so for me it was more like personal development right if you if you're not good at something or you're scared of something if you're scared of skydiving how do you solve that you got to jump out of a plane right um so just like that you have to kind of conquer that and uh, yeah for me it started off that way and then actually fell in love i love i really fell in love with the whole idea of you know having a full audience and then a topic and yeah it's just uh something i would recommend anyone to do really even on a small level public speaking is pretty cool yeah, it's um, I love those sorts of dual pronged approaches. Uh, every business decision I like to I, I make, I try to think of the scenario. How do I uh, win if I lose? So it's like a, almost a stop loss in pr place for it. So uh, say you pick that public speaking venture as a means of getting into the crypto space. Uh, but if you didn't manage to get into the crypto space and you stayed trading, you didn't manage to build that network, well, you would have come out with a great set of public speaking skills. So that exactly. it just helps you keep moving forward consistently and winning uh, and compounding those gains, which I really think is one of the biggest things yeah. to uh, success. Definitely. And even then, it's like if the loss itself is like a win, then you've not really lost. Um, it's a mentality thing as well. So. It's like never losing, right? If, if you do end up losing, just change the mentality. That's the outcome you really wanted. So yeah, it's, it's uh, exactly the right way to think about it. And isn't it one of the most essential things for, uh, I mean, uh, what, what's your story out of university? Did you uh, go straight into entrepreneurship? Did you uh, go straight into trading? Uh, have you had any business experience before in crypto? Um, I've from a long time, actually, even before university, just building small side businesses, um, you know, I think um, I had good entrepreneurs to look out and um, good role models like that. So I was a little bit lucky. Um, Who were your role models? I'd say my dad. My dad was a really, 
one of the best entrepreneurs I've ever seen. Um, he was he was a fantastic example. So for for me, it was never you know just do education. Education is great, but you know teach yourself new skills that a mm-hmm. class of a thousand people aren't learning at the same time as you by a professor. You know, um, so it's a good example for me. So even before university, even in secondary school and um, sixth form, all this other stuff, I used to do a lot of um, personal entrepreneur stuff. Could you give uh, some examples or maybe a story uh, about something that taught you a lot? Um, I think one example was um, right now you've probably heard of dropshipping. Dropshipping's like boomed now. I remember um, back in, I think I was like 18 years old and I had the idea for dropshipping. And back then there was very few resellers. Um, and I knew this was going to be a big industry. I knew it just made so much sense. Um, and I went to one of my friends and I said, let's start this. Let's get this up and moving. So we went to his dad. We started to try getting funding, you know, let's take this forward. He kind of like cushioned and destroyed the whole idea. Like, oh, no, it's not going to take off. So we were, you know, 18 year olds, you're not going to really push for it. If an adult tells you don't do it, you're going to think don't do it. Um, and then it grew to be this billion dollar industry. And we're just thinking, wow, we had the idea so early. So I made a promise to myself that next time I really get into an industry, I'm going to make it my entire life. I won't, you know, give up pretty much. Oh, wow. Um, so wait, who was it? Um, did you go to your dad with that idea at any point? I didn't go to my dad with the idea, actually. I'm not sure why. Um, because my dad gave me similar ideas more around, you know, try reselling certain things. But these are yeah. all like small business ideas anyway. Um, but the, how, how far you take it is a different question. But I still think like the skills are transferable, right? You learn things and you're then going to apply them to like the next ventures and the next ideas you have. Eventually something will kick off. Um, it's not a matter of like, if it's more when, to be honest, if you apply the same technique and stuff. So that really is, it's, it's a matter of when, as long as you, uh, it doesn't matter which direction you move in, as long as you're just moving in that direction and learning as you go, because it's not a straight line from like nothing to entrepreneurial success. You, you, you zigzag, you iterate nonstop, but you just need to take that first step. I, I remember, um, when I wanted to get into trading and investing, I had almost the exact same thing happen to me. I, I told, uh, someone, uh, who I trusted and looked up to, uh, that, Hey, this investing thing looks pretty cool. I, I've been reading this book. It was Intelligent Investor at the time. Here's what I learned. And they shut it down hard. He's like, oh, it's all just gambling. There's no way anyone can ever make money. The only investment that makes sense is real estate. And if if I'd listened to that, if I'd let that influence me, then my life would have taken a completely different trajectory. Yeah. It makes you think that in hindsight, you just wish that you you really, honest to God, down in your soul, you believe in something that's really good. Just do it. What's the worst that's going to happen, right? Um, but if you listen to other people, they're not telling you what's best for you. They're telling you based on their own experiences, their own life, their own trajectory. So depending on who it is, you've got to ask yourself the question, would I really want to be like them in 10 years or 20 years? Um, and that should influence your judgment and decision as well. I think you can dilute some opinions for sure. But the thing is, we're so influenceable, right? Like we're so easy to be molded into whatever people will tell us, especially at a young age, right? It's a bit typical. Yeah, I'd say we're still at that. Um, uh, well, maybe less so now. I think at 25, your brain's fully developed. Um, so mm. may- maybe less so, but still I look up to people who have far more experience than me. And uh, what you mentioned, I want to circle back to that gut intuition is so incredibly important to let that develop. That's when you need to make the mistakes because that'll fix your internal um, heuristics, your internal systems for decision making, really fast decision making as well. That is that gut instinct, the subconscious processing that's going on, that's making the decision based on all your past experience, uh, essential to develop, especially, and if you just continually go to other people and default to them and not really think through your decisions, you're never going to develop that gut instinct. Yeah. And I think the more you, it's like any muscle group, right? And we will get into fitness, but the more you um, activate it, the more uh, you can control it, the more it becomes defined. So again, not to use fitness as a metaphor, but it is actually true even with gut instincts, it becomes louder. You listen to it more. Um, it becomes more accurate, more precise. Um, and again, if you focus in on it and you activate it more, you listen into it, um, it, it applies the same way. So how did Daffy begin? How, all this entrepreneurial training, uh, create background, you did your public speaking. How did that end, to end up in Daffy? Um, I developed a few cool stuff in, in blockchain just as like side small ventures um nothing really took off more for me it was like um i just wanted to kind of really just start developing some stuff in the industry um and then daffy was something that 
um, initially we were just researching about, you know, how the 2019 market, you saw the huge uh, devaluation of loads of cryptocurrencies and loads of protocols far more than they should have been. So DAFI was kind of like initially a research concept. We're looking at how models like proof of stake could be improved. Models like staking could be improved. Um, and now what we've started to build is really interesting. It's, uh, it's really taken off from where we were maybe 12 months ago. And um, now it's like we're trying to make it kind of like the internet of staking is how we would describe it. Um, we build these gamified um, staking systems that are be better for long-term users, they're better for the protocols, etc. And now, right now we've been applying it to, you know, projects, you know, integrating it, adopting it. We've had multiple integrations this month. Um, and now we're trying to step it into things like GameFi, which is really interesting too. So why are the DAFI uh, products better for long-term stakers and users than just people building it on their own token? Um, so the way it works is essentially the rewards you get are kind of like, you can describe it to be in the form of a synthetic. So rather than staking in a normal system where you're just getting tokens, there's no adaptation to the market. There's no you know multiplication of the tokens or anything. Here with um, what we call staking 2.0, the rewards you're getting, they themselves will multiply if the network adoption kicks off. So you can think of if you were staking in a new project, a new protocol, or maybe you're staking when there's a bear market, uh, you'd see your rewards multiply as that protocol grows in adoption. Um, so that way it allows for scarcity and low demand. It, it's really cool. It, it's basically translating market volatility into reward volatility. Um, and that was the initial concept. It was... Um, we you know went through the whole thesis developed developed it as well for our own token and then for other projects as well which have gone live on it um and again this whole like using synthetics for staking is really interesting because it applies to you know even a lot of play to earn systems which we've seen really take off as well i think the next step is using more intelligent systems there too that benefit long-term holders uh, could you explain what a synthetic is say yeah so i mean synthetic i would say is any type of asset backed or collateralized by an underlying asset. So you can think of um, even crypto versions of traditional assets, uh, stocks, etc. You can have synthetic tokens on the blockchain. That's one example. And there's already projects doing stuff like that. Um, and any other asset that's backed or represented by something behind it. So for example, those that we create with DAFI, um, what we've been using so far is these synthetics that are backed by an underlying token, but the synthetics can multiply. Uh, what we're now developing is mostly around wrapped tokens, which will basically allow for more liquidity in staking, which is really cool. And again, these wrapped tokens, they're backed one by one to one by an underlying token. Um, it basically just allows for more flexibility, transferability, and really cool stuff, pretty much like programmable systems um, in things like staking, liquidity, gaming, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, let's say I release the AK token. Um, and this uh, gives you access to, uh, if you stake it, you get access to my newsletter. It's like a subscription model. And then I decide I want to reward people who are staking this token. Uh, if I were to give them just AK tokens, that is not ideal because um, then I have to keep uh, inflating the supply, circulating supply of AK tokens, correct? That's... Yep. But uh, if I were to go to Daffy and make Daffy AK token... Um, that is now a new token built purely for rewarding people who stake. Is it attached to the underlying AK asset? It is. Everyone would be able to take the DAK or the DAFI AK and convert it back to AK whenever they would like. But the cool thing here is that if users who are staking, you know, initially, imagine like whales who just came on day one um, and they're staking on day one. Um, if they want to exit the system, their DAK while it is one to one backed by AK tokens, it would be in less quantity. But then your, you know, your long term holders. So like those who listen to all your podcasts, um, you know, the AK army, pretty much. Um, <laughs> those who really care about the project and the platform, they'd see their DAK multiply over time when the platform becomes more adopted. Um, and when we say adopted, essentially the reason is because DAK as a synthetic is programmed to sense market demand. And technically, all that really means is kind of if you think about Ethereum, Ethereum is programmable contracts. So DAK is programmable reward. And it means that you can program it to increase based on, um, you know, your platform becoming more adopted, 
maybe it's more Twitter followers, maybe you know it's price increasing, etc. Pretty much anything you want, and that's when it gets very interesting. So uh, when you say programmable, you guys are designing the economic, the tokenomics. Um, so I come to D- uh, Daffy and I tell you guys, hey, I want this token to uh, increase in value as the market gets more volatile. And then d- do I have to tell you the mathematics, the underlying economics to make that happen? Or do you guys do that for the projects? Um, so far, we do it for the projects. So we had um, three uh, projects in the last two weeks go live. Um, and over time, the way it will be is a lot more permissionless, a lot more decentralized. It'll be pretty much like a platform where anybody can go to, to create synthetics for different applications, um, which is a direction where we're heavily traveling towards. And uh, why wouldn't I just create this synthetic myself, uh, just like I made the AK token and have it serve whatever function I want it to? There's a lot of contracts that go behind programming it securely, you know, so it's not just another token, it's actually, you know, it has these economic rules inside it. Um, it has uh, a lot of the the factors that have to make it function, adapt to market changes, you know, do so uh, without harming the, the economy itself. This is like where it gets a little bit really, really deep. Um, but you can think of even other applications where, so an interesting area we're going down is basically a platform where gamers and users can kind of take in-game assets and they can create the synthetic versions of these in-game assets and what's really cool here is it adds more liquidity in the metaverse if you want it's more of an interconnected gaming system where you can think of people actually playing games and they're staking for rewards but the rewards can either be in synthetics or they're minting synthetics while staking so it means that if you've ever heard of like liquid staking as a concept it means that you can actually stake whilst still spending your tokens and transacting your tokens because you're spending and transacting a synthetic, which is really cool. So there's a lot more like complexities that go into it. So for us, what we want to do is kind of make this accessible to the whole world. Um, essentially, more intelligent staking systems, better rewards for long-term users, um, and uh, do so you know with just intelligent economics. Yeah, that um. To- become very useful in games but even outside of games if i could just have a synthetic version of if that's already staked then why would i ever um opt to have if unless i obviously don't trust the place it's being staked or um but yeah that uh, makes a lot of sense there uh, and what does the next 12 months look like for daffy then as an investor why should i be interested uh what drives the value of daffy um, well, so far, we've what's really interesting is we've already demonstrated token utility, and the project's already at revenue stage, which is pretty cool. Um, so, to Do you guys have revenue right now? Yeah, we 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 just achieved a revenue stage last month, which is pretty cool. Um, so a lot of this comes through white labels and stuff like that. Um, and again, it just keeps you know the project allowing us to expand, grow. You know, we've got new hires coming in every few weeks, which is pretty cool. New fresh faces. Um, and uh, I think what we've noticed so far for the token utility side is pretty cool. Uh, the way it works right now is um, essentially for integrations to go live, partners or projects have to use Daffy to purchase it on Uniswap, for example, um, and they send it to the staking pool. So over time, the staking pool actually increases in rewards. So if you're staking Daffy, as integrations are going live, your rewards are increasing through the APY boosts. And also it means the circulating supply declines over time. So this is the first token utility, but more, of course, is coming. Um, it's just pretty cool to demonstrate that from day, well, not day one, but from the stage we're at right now. Um, for the next 12 months, it's just going to get better, really. Um, more products coming, a lot more focused on um, in-game assets and um, partnering with new GameFi projects. We've already demonstrated a few early ones, but um, we've got so much to reveal. I think probably January will be you know, dropping some huge, huge announcements around that, which will be really cool. And then from that point onwards, it's just aggressive adoption, um, getting more mainstream partners on board, major partners on board, um, and building more products around this new universe, pretty much. That exciting times to come. Uh, it, you're thinking far ahead. Uh, what are your general thoughts on the market right now? Because uh, you're a trader as well, and you're a founder inside. You're talking to a lot of people behind the scenes. Uh, does it feel toppy to you right now? Uh, does it feel like we've had enough of fun for now? You know what's really interesting, and the market will be very different. And 
people are always applying history to the current market, which while history does repeat itself, um, if everyone is expecting history to repeat itself, it won't repeat itself. Um, and a good example is um, compared to the past history, one very important factor that the market is different is in any of the other previous cycles, we've never really had the utility of tokens and protocols that we have right now. Like you can do so much stuff with yield farming, staking, um, you know, even governance right now. It, all of this stuff is now live for projects. It's now very accepted. If you look at every other previous cycle, you're buying tokens or cryptocurrencies and there's nothing you can do with it. You're just hoping someone buys higher price than you. Um, so eventually, because it's all based on speculation, you're going to get these harsh bear markets and these extreme bull markets within 10 days, Bitcoin does its greatest movements. Um, that won't happen anymore, in my opinion. I think um, market cycles will become more brief. Um, they'll become a bit less vicious as well. Um, you'll get bear markets for sure, but there will be you know very, very short-term ones. So I think even if we do feel toppy right now, which I think maybe two months ago, I definitely was feeling. Um, and you can tell that because when we have five or 10% retracements, everyone's aggressively saying, oh, buy the dip, buy the dip. Um, you know, sale prices, uh, Black Friday sales, all this other cool stuff on uh, crypto Twitter. <laughs> um, but the truth is that if that's the case, then you should be doing the opposite, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's my take on it. I think market cycles for bear markets will become a lot shorter. So if we, even if we do hit a top, I wouldn't be too scared, in my opinion. Just trust the fundamentals. Yeah, uh, I definitely feel that argument. Uh, a lot of people feel the utility has uh, increased drastic. Well, not increased. It exists now. Um, people are actually lending, borrowing money. People are actually using decentralized exchanges. People are actually playing these games and making full-time livings off of them. In fact, it's drastically affecting economies around the world. Uh, but then... Um, on the other side, we have, uh, like you said, speculation has gone down, but we still have $800 million valuations for products that don't even exist yet, that don't even have a roadmap, um, that are just ideas, that, that sort of activity. Um, as a founder, how do you feel when stuff like that happens? Doesn't that, isn't that a sign, for, a cause for concern? Yeah. Um, you know, from a founder side, it's actually even worse, I would say, because you've got an unnaturally high exposure to the market um it's always going to be that way and i would say maybe less now but maybe nine months ago market fluctuations really affect morale it affects you know men mental health all this other stuff because you know you're in this market and you're building in the market too um which i would say is overcoming that you know taking taking a step back is probably the most crucial i wish i did so maybe eight or nine months ago um but yeah, I think, um, I think that's a key thing, you know, with the market, when you see these excessive valuations and, you know, especially if you're building like 24 seven, not sleeping. Um, I think I just started taking Sundays off like two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think when you see that, it's not the best thing to see. You do want things to be, you know, justified, normalized. Um, I think Daffy itself is, uh, probably like 30 million market cap right now, but it's like the way we put effort into it is as if we're we're aiming so much higher and we're not content and i don't think ever we should ever be content especially at these levels um, but we do want things you know to be a bit more justified in the market but sometimes it's irrational you just have to play with the cards you dealt with yes yeah it's um irrational but also not rational as well because it, it's a direct representation of people's excitement people's greed um people's perhaps misconceptions like if people think certain things are going to happen faster than they are the market over overvalues it or perhaps the things that are going to happen are so important that people want to flood money into that space it, it does help accelerate innovation to a degree as well as, well as the downsides that come with it a bit of a double-edged sword as the crypto industry continues to mature it's natural that more and more wealth building platforms will arise the problem with many of these, however, is that they are often so complex that it disincentivizes people from using them. This is why I've partnered with Nexo, one of the top crypto lending platforms in the world. With over 1.5 million users and 15 billion assets under management, Nexo combines the yield earning features of crypto with the familiarity and ease of centralized finance. 
Nexo allows you to earn interest at a competitive rate on crypto and fiat. They also allow you to take out loans using crypto as collateral so that you have access to cash without needing to sell your investment. You can even trade directly on the web platform and mobile app in an intuitive and secure way. If you're looking to embark on the journey to financial freedom whilst minimizing time and frustration, I highly recommend you check them out by visiting nexo.io. That's N-E-X-O dot I-O. But you said you just started taking Sundays off. How do you, um, what, well, I know you don't because I don't either. And we've spoken about this before. We don't have work-life balance. What have you learned about work-life balance during this period? What steps have you taken to uh, not just be um, have better work-life balance, but actually be more productive as well? Because when you find that balance, it helps you be more efficient, operate better. Yeah. Um, I would say probably step one is engrave work-life balance as early as possible because when you don't, it's hard to then come back to normality and it becomes so, so, you know, this life becomes so normalized to you that it's hard to go back to one way that you used to be. Um, so I'd say step one is don't end up letting it go for so long. But you and I, and I think many people listening as well, they realize that you know, you've got a graft and you've got a grind and you've got to put every every hour. But again, it's if you can't look after yourself, then you can't look after you know your community, your product, your vision. Um, so step one is looking after yourself, really. Um, I think you know, for me, I've always noticed that when you go to nature, I don't know what it is. I think maybe because we're in such a digital world and such a a virtual industry, but when you go back to nature and back to basics, you really, I don't know, maybe it's um an innate human thing, but you really feel uh more more calm more refreshed more relaxed and reset pretty much um, there's probably loads of psychological studies that back it up but um, that's what i would say even if you get like an hour a day or every now and then it just it makes such a big difference and also meditating right like we we briefly spoke about that um a few months ago but that's something i really want to start doing because you just need to calm and calm yourself down and just reset your your balance and your energy pretty much uh, the chains of habit are too light to be felt unle- until they're too heavy to be uh, broken. Uh, it's it's really well put that um, you have to not let yourself get there in the first place. And uh, it's difficult to do because uh, so much of entrepreneurship on social media is hustle, sacrifice absolutely everything in your life. That's really the only way uh, you can get anything. And that is true to a degree. I think the majority of people don't have a problem with working too hard. They have a problem with um, being entitled and not quite putting enough in. But uh, for those that do end up uh, getting in the flow of things, and especially in crypto where you have that ability to be 24-7, sometimes it's not even work as well. It's like uh, people just stare at charts 24-7. Then They can't actually do anything about it. They can't do anything about Bitcoin going up or down. They're not going to make any trades, but they're just sat there staring at the market. So deliberately putting that time aside uh, becomes... Uh, just productive it becomes productive because you're wasting your time and you're you're wasting your willpower your precious willpower which is one of the most important resources to manage throughout the way but throughout the day doing something inefficient where you could be replenishing your willpower by meditating by going out there and working out yeah i mean it's it's a scarce resource right and once it's gone it's hard to build it all back up um and you're exactly right you know a lot of it's glorified as well like you know the only way to achieve success is if you're grinding through the night, pulling all nighters, <laughs> working through weekends. It's somewhat true to an extent, but not always at all. Um, like even just spending time with your family, you'll make a huge difference, but you don't realize it. Um, I think, yeah, that was probably something I wish I had started doing sooner. Um, but it's never too late, right? Yeah, definitely never too late. And I- I'm not complaining because our, um, <laughs> our crazy work ethics did get us... Um, to, to, to where we are now, which um, I'm pretty happy with. Um, it's doing reasonably well in a thriving industry like crypto is a great place to be. Um, and doing it in our 20s as well, getting there in our 20s is something I know a lot of the younger listeners are striving towards. If I am, um, because I get a lot of messages from people who are in university or very early on in their careers, uh, what advice would you give them if they're interested in getting involved in the crypto space? I would say just get stuck in, even if it's not, you know, 
building the next um, layer one protocol, even if it's something small, you know, like even if you just want to, um, you know, design some NFTs or host a small event and get together in crypto, um, anything really, the moment you start taking action, it goes from being a concept and an idea to reality. Um, and the sooner you can bridge that gap, the better really, because it becomes a lot more real and you start to get that momentum from there and it just keeps building. Um, for me, I didn't actually notice anything in crypto become tangible to become real until I started to go to university events and stuff and start to, you know, actually host these type of things. Um, and then it became a momentum thing more than anything. So I think for anyone who's young, I would not actually let your age be a factor because one thing about crypto I absolutely love about the industry is um, the thing is young people see the world with a different mindset, with a different uh, perspective. And that's why crypto's really thrived. And a lot of the innovation, even if you look at some of the best ideas in the industry and the best spokespeople and the people, they're really young, right? It's actually quite noticeable. And I would really count it down to the fact that if you're young, you see the world through a different set of eyes. You know, we've not seen the tech boom as, you know, much as, you know, people in their 50s and 60s have done. And while many of them are fantastic in the industry too, I think crypto, it gives you the ability for age to not be as high of a barrier, you know, so I wouldn't let that to be, you know, a setback. If anything, that's your superpower, right? Just tap into it. Look at uh, things with a different perspective. Look at different concepts and theories and models in blockchain and crypto. And, you know, there's so much opportunity here. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it's probably the best thing that can happen to you starting early. Uh, that really is the best advice. And it's just do something, anything, do something, anything, host an event, make an NFT, um, make memes on Twitter. That's actually a genuine way to get involved. People who were just making memes and uh, playing around on Twitter are now actually launching um, NFT based projects that people love that bring happiness and they're making money off of it, which is great for them. They're uh, contributing to society. Um, and th th that's the main thing. Make sure you in some way add value to the crypto community or society as a whole. It's the best way to get directly rewarded and forget about the money side. Um, it's uh, something I'd compound. So move in, uh, do anything, make sure it adds value to the crypto space, society as a whole, and you'll probably end up um, having everything else sorted itself out, really. Um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think the money part i would say is a side effect more than a primary objective if that's like your main effect then you can be looking at things differently just start anything do anything small um and then let you know the next thing you work on will be bigger and better and that's the way forward to be honest um i think anyone you know, who's young they should dive into yeah. it yeah 100 percent. if you're young right now um in some way be involved in crypto and i was just going to add on if you're just focused on the money um it's not sustainable because you're taking more than you give and you might be okay for one year, two years, maybe even, heck, I don't know, five years, you do really well. Eventually, someone's going to come into the game that adds value and makes the same yeah. amount of money and you're going to get pushed out the market. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's always a side effect, right? And it should be a secondary goal. And if you have that mentality, I actually think um, it, it attracts, it, it comes to you more than if you chase after it. Um, I'm not sure why that's the case, but it, I've noticed that to be true in a lot of the other stories. Well, I think that's the case because um, money's... I think the the way society offer, operates the best is because is when um, capital is efficiently allocated. So when you do something that adds disproportionately to society, you should get disproportionate capital so you can either increase the effects of whatever you're doing or be incentivized to continue doing whatever you're doing. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Minecraft. The, the founder of Minecraft made a crazy amount of money, multi-billionaire, I think. Um, and why? Because he created unlimited entertainment. So you create unlimited value, uh, unlimited amounts of an extremely valuable resource and you get rewarded for it. Um, if we take... Um, Daffy protocol, for example, like if you guys are important to crypto and the market, money should flow into that. Why? Because then you can do more important stuff that adds value to the market. Uh, but if you guys were focused on how do we make Daffy protocol make the most amount of money ever, then, well, you, you, you're going to focus on just making money and not the underlying thing that attracts money to you disproportionately. Yep. It's a value add, right? It's a, it's a conversion through value and impact on an industry. Um, and it, it draws itself to, you know, as long as you provide value and you trust in that, then 
it, it's actually pretty you know peaceful knowing that um it really is because you don't need to chase after it and you won't have a heart attack or anything if the market crashes or something or if the project price you know goes down 10 percent um so yeah i think when you just have that long-term longevity approach um you know let's just provide value what can we do better what can we you know do for the industry and actually have an impact more than anything i think the reason i would ever go into creating a project for me is um thinking about history right so much of it goes you know, 99.9% of people have forgotten about, right, in history. The only thing that's actually immortal is impact. Impact on the world, impact on society, impact on lives. Um, you know, that's what I think, for me, really, on a spiritual level, drives me to, you know, go down the innovation path, go down something disruptive, something that provides value to the world. Um, and I feel like I'm still just getting started. and got so much left to, to offer, really. I feel like I've probably done 2% so far. Um, and I think when you think like that, it does help a lot more to have the right mentality going forward. I'm looking forward to seeing the Zane legacy unfold. <laughs> what mark will you leave on this world? Uh, and uh, let's keep track of the journey. Maybe have you on the podcast again, is six months, 12 months down the line. Uh, Zane, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, we've spoken about, I, I think it's a really useful episode to anyone um, who's, looking to get involved in the crypto space, interested in entrepreneurship as a whole, and um, interested in seeing the future of Daffy as well. Zane, do you have anything for our listeners before we wrap this episode up? Um, no, actually, not nothing too specific, but I, I hope everyone like you know got something of value from, from the episode, and uh, definitely we should follow up on it. Um, I think it was, it was really great, and it's always good you know, just to tell your story a little bit, you know, um, give your own perspective on things. I really enjoyed it all. Absolute pleasure. Meditators, that's all from us. I'll see you next time.